Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. How's everyone doing? I hope you guys are settling into 2021. (laughs) I mean, wow, y'all. Wow, we thought this was going to be a better year so far. <laughs> oh my god. I don't I I don't even want to get into it. I am just going to go straight into introducing my guest this week. So my guest this week is Daniel Harold. Uh, Daniel is the co-creator of Divorced Over 40, which is an online community that provides resources and real life testimonials to divorcees over 40 years old. Uh, Daniel is a resident of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he's been divorced for nearly two years now, and he has three daughters. And I'm really excited to have talked to, uh, to bring this interview to you because this is an example of what's possible, uh, when you get divorced. Um, so there's a couple of aspects to Daniel's story. One is his incredibly deep respect and commitment to the woman who had stayed at home for years and years and years to raise uh, their children. And, you know, as I've talked about many times, the investment that women make in our households in uh, raising children is really not respected. um, And certainly you don't get a great return on that investment um, if you get divorced. So, uh, Daniel, I call him the unicorn in this because he really, really, um, honored and respected, um, his ex-wife in this, in their divorce process. And it's, and I want you guys to hear that. I really want you to hear stories like this because it's, I think it's really important. And then also divorced over 40 is this really, really, really cool network that Daniel created with some friends of his. And, um, it's kind of blown up and taken off in ways that they never anticipated. (laughs) They're just like, you know, some regular people uh, in Oklahoma who, you know, had this idea to like actually hang out with each other. And so it's really a great conversation about friendship and community and rebuilding community after divorce. So I'll shut up and let Daniel do the talking. So please welcome my guest, Daniel Harold. Hello, Daniel. Thank you so much for joining me and coming to talk about like all the things <laughs> from the male perspective. It's nice to be on your program. Thanks for having me, Kate. Yeah. So, gosh, there's so many things. First, why don't you just tell us about Divorced Over 40? Let's just start there sure. since that's how we met. And I think it's really cool. It's something that started actually back in August. It's fairly new. You know, it's only, what, five months now? And really the genesis of it was a group of friends. I formed a group of, there were six of us that formed kind of a unique bond during COVID. And uh, we were hanging out a lot, doing a lot of social things because, you know, you're kind of shut down and we kind of stayed in our own little group. And um, we were all kind of at the same exact same stage of life. We were all in our forties. There's one in her fifties divorced. Some had just been divorced or was going through it. Others had been divorced, you know, five years plus and all going through the same issues, you know, with co-parenting and dating and just trying to create friendships. And, and so it was just a, it was honestly kind of like a shit show during that time. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> you were all like recently divorced too, like within the last couple of years, right? You- Several of us was, so I, I'm, my divorce was, two years ago in G- this January. And then there was another gentleman that was in our group that was the, about the same time. And then we had a, a lady that was divorced, you know, like six months ago. So a lot of us were going through the early, as you know, a lot of the early emotional stuff that goes with kind of recovering and healing out of a divorce. Yeah. You know, we just decided 
to kind of chronicle our lives through Instagram more as a self-deprecating <laughs> account to kind of talk about all the stuff that we kind of go through. And we all sat down in a room and uh, I remember the, the meeting and, and, you know, I'm trying to herd the cats cause I'm like the organizational guy. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, what are we, how are we going to start this thing? Cause I had set up the account and we said, well, why don't we all just kind of give a unique perspective on our divorce? And so the first series that all of us wrote about weren't funny at all. <laughs> they were <laughs> raw, transparent, emotional dialogue or conversations that came out of, a, of what we were talking about, of, of how we experience a divorce, each of us in a unique way. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all have our networks, personal networks through social media, Instagram, Facebook, friends, started sharing it. And the feedback was just overwhelming, you know, just people really just the validation of uh, what we were experiences, what they experienced. And as you know, a lot of times in divorce, at least through my experience, you know, you're kind of on your own, unless you are going to see a therapist, um, you're kind of doing it solo, trying to figure out how to navigate a lot of different aspects in life. Yeah. And it's, it's from living by yourself and dealing with loneliness to dealing with paying the bills. If you hadn't done that before to co-parenting and trying to do that to arguing with your ex. I mean, there's a whole slew of issues that um, you deal with many initially, many, many years afterwards. And so I felt like we really helped people. Um, it helped, it was a validation tool for people to say, Oh my gosh, I went through that. And I thought I was the only one that went through that. Yeah. It's interesting. One of the things that I find um, working with clients, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, is that, you know, as soon as you get divorced, everyone has an opinion on divorce. Everyone has an opinion on how you're supposed to do it on, you know, call a lawyer or whatever it is, where people have a lot of, of opinions about something that most of them have never gone through, <laughs> right? Or like they know one person and like it went this way for them. So now this is what they're going to impose on you. And it, you know, your point about this community, right? It's really important that you actually surround yourself with people who are going through it, who understand it or who have been through it rather than all of these people and all of their opinions on something that they've literally never experienced before. Well, a lot of times, God help them, the family jumps in and we'll talk about whether it's their experience or they want to chime in on who you should hire and how you should handle, you know, divorce and, and your ex. And right. so you're right. I think the, the biggest feedback that we've gotten outside of the validation is I want to be a part of a community of like-minded and like-kinded people, mm, people, that. That have, they, people that have been divorced yeah. because it's hard to, to associate yourself and be, and be friends with married people while you're in the season of your life. It really is as well as family and a lot of other issues. So, you know, we can talk, a whole, there's a whole other topic about just the fact that you lose all your friends. Yes. I did want to, I actually do want to touch on that because especially from the male perspective, right? I mean, you know, you've said that, you know, when, when you're married, you know, women tend, tend to, I'm going to be very general, general about this. So I don't want to hear all sorts of <clears throat> backlash, but generally speaking, women are like the social managers, right? And the friends that, that you make are usually friends like through the kids or through the school or whatever. And they're all married. Right. And I, I know that men in particular have this problem when they get divorced, where they're suddenly like, well, shit, what happened to my friends? Or like, do I have friends? Wait a minute. Did I ever choose any friends? <laughs> right. So talk about that. You had that experience a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so interesting. So I took the notion when, when I got married that, I'm not the, I wasn't the type of guy that goes and does the boondoggles that goes and golfs every Saturday. I mean, I really, uh, my commitment was to my career and to my family mm -hmm. and we had kids right out of the gate. And so we were dealing with kids stuff in our early twenties. And so I didn't cultivate in hindsight, I wish that I did, but I didn't cultivate a lot of meaningful guy relationships throughout my marriage. And in many cases, particularly if your wife is a stay at home mom, they are your social chairman mm -hmm. because they want to get out. They're tired of dealing with the kids. They're like, we want to get out. So they're either going to coordinate the dates for you 
well, they're going to coordinate the double and triple dates for you. Yeah. And so my ex-wife was the same way where she set up everything and we had, you know, maybe a circle of, and it, and it comes and goes, but a circle of three to five couples that we would go out on a regular basis. And when you get, you know, then the divorce occurs, the, the married people don't necessarily want to hang out with a single guy, let alone maybe the single girl. Yeah. And I remember I, I reached out to one of my friends who was married and said, Hey, let's go have drinks. We went and had happy hour. And I hadn't caught up with him in years. And I was trying to make an effort to kind of establish some guy friendships. And I said, Hey, we ought to do this at least once a month. And he said, he said to me, he said, you know, I would really love that, but can we do maybe a coffee or a breakfast and not, not a happy hour? And it's, and it's because his wife didn't want her husband to hang out with a single guy in a bar yeah. in a restaurant during happy hour. And so, you know, you kind of deal with those issues where maybe the spouse doesn't feel comfortable with their spouse hanging out with single people. Yeah. So you kind of deal with that. So you're left with a lot of times, particularly the men, not a whole lot to kind of grab onto. Yeah. I think the right. women, fortunately create their little circles and have friendships. And, and when they, when they get divorced, many of those are still intact. Um, a lot of those may be single cause they're divorced, but I think on the men's side, you really left on an Island and you have to kind of restart. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really interesting, right. That guy, I mean, guys in particular, and like you were talking about, like, like really trying to forge guy friendships. Right. And it's funny. I have, I have like conflicting thoughts about your friend <laughs> and his and him saying like on the one hand I'm like he should be able to go out with his guys for you know for a drink and then on the other hand I'm like fucking good for him he knows that she's not comfortable and he will adjust his plans to yeah. you know it's really respectful so yeah I mean I think that I think there's there's reality and then there's like fantasy of what you want it to be like he should totally you know anyway here's what guys do yeah. So they get divorced. They don't have a lot of friends. So where, where do they dive into? They dive into dating. Right. That's the way to feel, to create the connection. And they're not ready to date. They haven't healed. They're not emotionally available. And they kind of go through the wild phase. Like a lot of people do when they, when they get divorced, when they come out of it. But a lot of men focus on that when in reality, they should probably should focus more on self-care, yeah. healing, and maybe est- establishing that friendship group to help the healing process. And you kind of did both. You, you had a very, I think, unique and sort of approach to dating that was, had a, had a lot of integrity. Will you tell us what, tell, tell the people, yes. <laughs> tell everybody, tell us what you well, did. You know, so here I am, I came out of a 22 year marriage and I was with her for 26 years. I started dating her at 19 and I was divorced. I was 45. So I'd never been dating before. Yeah. I didn't know what that was like and the pursuit of women and getting the feedback from women that you're a handsome man and, and so forth. It's, it was all new territory for me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just like any, most guys, I jumped right into a relationship that was exclusive with a girl. And I, after about 90 days, I, I realized that that wasn't going to work. And it kind of changed my mindset that, okay, well, I enjoy dating. It was fun going out with this woman, but I know that I should probably not get serious with someone else until I kind of get my shit together. Yeah. And, you know? And so Good for you, at least you only did it once. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. And I, you know, I, and I traveled a lot and the allure of, you know, with dating apps where you can meet people from across the country, I took advantage of that. And I was very explicit with both locally. And um, when I traveled to say, Here's where I am. I just got divorced. Um, I'm not looking for anything serious. I'm coming into town or I'm here in Tulsa. Would love to go out and have a date with you. Would would love to go have fun. And I'd get answers like go pound sand or get lost. (laughs) A lot of people would immediately go to, okay, well, he's just looking for hookups. You know, when he's out. Yep. Yep. Um, um, But other people, as we would dialogue, um, would realize, oh, well, he's, I get where he is. He's not ready. Obviously the long distance is a whole other topic in itself. And, and there's a, there was a subset of women that would be like, yeah, if you ever come in town, let's go have a drink. And so what's interesting about that is a lot of those are still have now turned into friendships 
and they're all, you know, we're following each other on social media and sending Christmas cards to each other. And <laughs> it's really been rewarding from that perspective. I've actually had some right on our, on our divorce over 40. Um, oh, that's so yeah. sweet. Yeah. That's so nice. I, I, I told you this the other day that like, I, I think I saw you on one of the, one of the apps, like, I don't know if you were traveling in LA or someone yeah. like you, but I feel, yeah. I feel like it was you who was just, and I, and I remember reading the profile and being like, that is not for me because that's not what I'm looking for, but like fucking good for him. Like I'd never seen it just so direct and honest. And I didn't, and I felt like that's it. That's what we all need to be doing on dating apps, right? We all need to be really fucking clear about what it is we want, where we're at in our lives. And it would just save So, but we have to actually know that about ourselves. That's the other thing. So we actually have to know right. It's a self-discovery process, but also at the same time, you've got to be very explicit about what you want and what you don't want, particularly on the dating apps. And don't compromise those values just because someone is good looking or someone is extra flirty and the banter is so good. And you're like, oh, screw it. I'm going to go out with them, even though I know that's not, it's going to crash and fall. Right. A lot of people fall into that. You got to stick to your guns. I and mean, People marry that. Life, right. Like, People, you know, the number of people who get married because of that, right? Like, oh, the banter's like all the red flags and all the like things that tell you that this is not the relationship for you, but like the sex is good <laughs> or like we have so much fun together or, you know, all of that, right? We all have to learn. A- if you're going to be explicit and upfront on the front end, be explicit and upfront on the back end too. On the during end, right? Like, yeah, like the day yeah. after, if, if particularly if they're local, say, you know what? And I've done this so many, t- not so many, but several times where I've, there wasn't a connection. And I, the very next morning, I sent, reached out to them and said, hey, I had a lot of fun. It was nice to get to know you. I don't think that there's anything here romantically, but would love to be your friend. Yeah. Instead yeah. of ghosting the, the people, you know? Right. Hello. We're 40 and 50 year olds. Can we not just be act like adults? Perfect grown-ups, right? Exactly. Oh my lord. Um, so speaking of being a unicorn, <laughs> Daniel Harold is a unicorn. That's our that's our Ben and uh and Susan and I have dubbed you a unicorn. I don't know about that. Um, but <laughs> just take it, just take it. You are you're upfront, you're honest, and but the way that you divorced your wife. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but the way that you went through your divorce and how you honored and respected her as a stay-at-home mom was like the first time I heard you tell the story, I was like, you got to be shitting me (laughs) because it's so unique and it's so important. And I, so I want you to tell people that story because I think it's really important. And by the way, Kate, I think that was the first time that I've ever really verbally told my story. So (laughs) I've reflected on it a lot and I've told bits and pieces to people, but that was the first time that I've kind of said it in public. Um, I did blog about it, but I won't go into the reasons why the divorce occurred or where, what manifested it, but we were clearly both very unhappy. And my ex-wife was a stay at home mom. She chose that right out of the gate because we had kids at 24 yeah. and she chose to raise all of the kids and, you know, there were some, several little stints of hobbies that she'd pursue and maybe a job here or there. But by and large, we had agreed, whether it was explicitly or implicitly, that I was going to be the breadwinner and I was going to focus on my career. And I worked like a sled dog early in my in during the marriage with the aspiration of making a lot of money to support the family. And with her providing that role, I was able to do those things. I was able to travel. I was able to work, you know, 60, 70 hours a week in many cases because of the partnership that I'd had with her. Right. So, you know, here we were coming up on a, the divorce and the reality sets with her that, oh my gosh, I've got to go start over my career. And what I'm do starting I do? over when she's like, like, she didn't have a resume. She had no right. Exactly. She had started so young, you know, in her 20s, like start over or like actually create out of thin air, right? Really. Exactly. And so I understood that. I also understood that 
the opportunity costs that she had by being married to me for 22 years and bypassing her career um, was significant. And if she would have maintained a career starting at the point at which we got married up into where we were today, she would have accumulated a tremendous amount of wealth and was pro- would probably be making a, a lot of money, probably more than I am. Right. So I just viewed it as a partnership and that I needed to fiscally be responsible to take care of her. And so, you know, we sat down because she was very nervous about, you know, she heard from her friends, to your point, everybody's whispering in their ears, oh, you better lawyer up. Your husband's going to screw you. You got to go get the best lawyer in town, be the first one to get one. And she would verbalize these things to me because she's scared to death. And I said, you know, Amanda, let me come over and let's just spend some time and let's work out a budget and let's go through all of our assets, all of our liabilities, and let's settle it. And so I did. I, came, I went over, we spent an hour and a half going through it and got her to a point where she felt very comfortable. And we hired an, one attorney and said, draw it up and let's get it done. And so that's it. <laughs> so, Right. And that's it. Right. And that's, that's so, it. I mean, I was in her position. I hadn't done it for, you know, as long as she did, but it's terrifying. It's terrifying to look at your future and realize I don't really have anything. <laughs> you know, I've, I've given all of us over, but I, I, you know, I remember my ex when our son was born and he would come home from work and his work schedule was erratic. Right. He, you know, he works in the entertainment industry, never knew when he was working. It was 10 to two one day, you know, eight to midnight the next, like you just don't know. And he would come home and he would say, I'm so lucky. He said, I know that I wouldn't be able to do any of what I'm doing. If I didn't, if I like, I know you you have it handled. I don't have to worry about who's feeding the baby, who's putting him to bed, getting another set, like nothing you have it handled. And if we were both working, we would both be scrambling and it would be a whole thing. So he's like, I feel like I've got this taken care of and you have this handled. And he, you know, again, similarly, he really respected that the investment that I made. And I, and I just, it's so rare, you know, so many men, I posted a couple of weeks ago on in something on Instagram about financial abuse. And this guy came out of nowhere and was like, you know, cursing up a storm, which, you know, I don't mind, but about how, you know, women, you know, taking advantage of men and living off of us and, you know, and then you want everything in return and like all this stuff. And I was like, that's, that is more often the, the attitude, right. And the perspective. And it's so disheartening. Yeah, it really is. And, and I think that um, a lot of that is, is I think people giving advice, bad advice to them, to men. I think a lot of it, you know, an attorney right or wrong, their responsibility, why they're hired is to provide the best deal for their client. And so they're going to be motivated to provide that type of advice. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of times in a divorce, both whether it's a man or a woman, the kind of the, the innate selfishness that we all have yeah. as humans comes out. Yeah. Start to rationalize as a man. Well, gosh, I worked really hard for this. I work, you know, this is a 30 year accumulation of my career and I'm just going to give it all away. Well, you, and they're not looking at the perspective of you wouldn't be where you are on the top of the mountain if it weren't for your, your wife. Right. You know? Right. Or you would be, or you wouldn't have, or you'd be alone, right? Like either you have someone who's supporting the household and the kids and the, all of that, or you just never got married. <laughs> you know, so. no, I agree. And, you know, I also look at, looked at the perspective of, do I really want to create this rough storm that I'm going to be in for however long it's going to impact my kids. It's going to impact my emotional state. It's going to mm-hmm. impact my ex's emotional state estate. It's going to disappoint my in-laws who I love very much. It's going to disappoint my parents and stress them out. And so I looked at it from that perspective of, you know what? I would much rather take the high road and do what I felt was right than listen to all this advice that's coming in and trying to make the best deal for myself. And my conscience is clear and I, and I feel good about it. And my ex would, she'd be the first to tell you he did take care of me. He is taking care of me. Now she's gone off and she has a great career that she's restarted Oh, is doing really well. Oh, good. And I'm proud of her and excited for her, but I'm glad I was in the position to help out and do the right thing. 
Yeah. And, you know, I will say that my business, right, I was able to build my business because of the support that I got, right? Had I not gotten the support that I got to start off, I mean, it's been 11 years. It's I didn't get 11 years of spousal support, by the way, at all. <laughs> but had I not had that support, I would not have been able to build this business. I would probably be working like at Trader Joe's, not right. that there's anything wrong with that, but like I would have had to have gone to work to get, I would have had to have get a, gotten a job as opposed to building uh, a business and a career that I'm really invested in that I love. And I think that's a huge issue for women is that so, and this, this is, you know, this is a feminist issue. This is a patriarchy issue. This is a, an issue of women do this thing where we stay home and we, you know, support the careers of others. And then on the back end, we don't get the support or, you know, the system doesn't support us. And so we're, we're kept at in lower financial positions right. than we would otherwise have been able to achieve. Right. 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 And yeah. It, and it, and it and takes, I think it's a responsibility of the man, the, the spouse to fill the gap. I a hundred percent agree. And I wish it was, you know, I wish this was more of a, a universal way of thinking of things because, so let me ask you a question. I think it's to what do you attribute your, the integrity and the, you know, so many people are so reactive to these things, right. And, and there's so much emotional heat around in, in divorce and somehow you were able to put whatever that was aside and really come to the table with this level of integrity and keeping your whatever emotional baggage or resentment, you know, out of it and show up, as you said, with your conscience clear in your, your highest self and people, a lot of people aren't able to do that. So how do you, what do you, how do you account for that? Well, and I wouldn't say that this has been a calm sea the whole time. So of course it, not. Right. Of course well, not. I'm right. Kind of that I'm not, I'm not a unicorn when it comes to divorcing someone. <laughs> We definitely have had our battles and it hasn't been all roses, but th that's a really good question. I think that I've always been a very laid back, even keeled person. I don't get emotional. I'm not quick to anger. Um, I'm not a very emotional person. I'm, I'm probably more self-reflective and thoughtful than uh, I'm impulsive, but I'm also, I think about things. And to me, probably the most important thing despite the in-laws and my parents and, and even how my ex viewed me, um, what was probably the most important thing to me was protecting my kids emotionally. And I wanted to leave a legacy with them that they knew that I took care of their mom. That was, that was probably the most important thing. That was like the foundation of where all my decisions came off of. And it's, you know, it's so rewarding. We're now almost two years out to be able to go over to my ex's house Christmas morning and continue that tradition of the kids coming down and, you know, they're all teenagers and, and in college, but we still, they still came down and they saw presents laid out for them from their mom. And they, they had presents for me. You know, you look at that and you're like, gosh, and that's just two years out of it to be able to, to maintain a tradition and, and be civil. And, you know, I just look at those type of examples or occurrences in my life. And I'm like, gosh, I made the right decision there. Absolutely. Do you think that it affected you that you have girls? Do you think that was? Um, probably so to some degree. I think I, I did want them subconsciously to know, to know this is how a man should treat a woman. This is how you should address conflict. This yeah. is how you should resolve issues. This is the type of man that you should look for that has a, that wants to take care of you. So yes, I, I think it probably I don't know. I don't know if my fangs would have came out, come out if I had boys versus girls, but I think I was a little bit more delicate. Yeah. And just how I navigated through that because, you know, I wanted to make sure that I, it was a learning lesson for them, honestly. And Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're lucky to have you as a dad. Well, thank you. It hasn't been easy, but, but it's, it's not right. It's not easy. It's not easy to maintain integrity when you actually want to like, throttle the person or, you know, clean it up when you do. Right. I mean, it's never perfect. It's never perfect. And that's what, you know, one of the things I always talk about is like, my, I mean, my ex and I have both just done stupid shit and had, you know, said, said stupid shit and 
gotten into like the worst of the worst, but it's our cleaning it up. Right. That's been able to, you know, maintain this relationship over all of its ups and downs. Like I told you earlier, like, you know, his wife didn't talk to me for like, a, it was like a good couple of years. And, you know, now we all, we all spent Christmas together and it was great. Fucking hell. We had the best time. We watched that <laughs> Kentucky fried lifetime movie. That was the best. Did you see that? <laughs> Did you know about that? No, I don't. Oh my God. Lifetime and Kentucky fried chicken partnered. <laughs> To make a mini First of all, movie. Lifetime is a no for me. I, I've seen way too much Lifetime. <laughs> marriage. My ex used to come home when I was like lying on the couch watching Lifetime and he'd just walk in the door and be like, what did he do? <laughs> I'm like, he had an affair and then he stole her. <laughs> like, whatever. That's oh <laughs> yeah, terrible. Anyway, that's what we did together. We had a great time. And, and you know, it, it really is the, it's not, it's not that we have it perfect, right? And I think this is this goes to what you're saying, your point, is that it's not about getting it perfect or not having the bumps in the road, but it is about whether it's cleaning them up or just, I don't know, what, how would you put it? Well, I mean, it's it's always a work in progress. I would, I would agree with that. It's something that, because we all, we're navigating it for the first time, all of it, in most cases we are. So we don't know what the hell we're doing. And so- You know, I just think that I just am not a big rock the boat guy and I just never intended to do that. And, you know, I try to avoid that at all costs, even now when we have our little disputes about this or that, it's, you know, it's like, is it really worth it at the end of the day? And I always tell people, the the people that get under my tent and know what my financial obligation is. And they're like, are you serious? I say, you know what? Money's replaceable. Yeah. My happiness is not, it's difficult to replace in my but money, money, you know, I'll just, I'll just work harder or I'll just ramp up my career or whatever. You know, I'm not worried about that piece of it. Yeah. And, but yeah, it is, it's definitely a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> and you had, you had friends, you've said that like you had friends and family members who were like, who were encouraging you to not take care of your ex. Well, maybe not, like, maybe the better term is not to the level that I did. Right. You know, like, and so I tried to keep people out of my business and then I'd have, you know, of course, once you get, once you file, then your decree gets in the public domain. And so I had a, a, a significant other that went and read everything and told me everything that I did wrong. And, and I'm like, you know what, that's none of your business. Boundaries. <laughs> you no, know, it's so funny how people like, you know, the one mistake that we did, I don't even know if I should tell the story, but I will is you know, the day that we filed, we were going to tell the kids the next day, or maybe we filed that morning. We we're going to tell them that afternoon. I can't remember what the circumstances were, but it hit the hit the newspaper before we had a chance to tell our kids. And I mean, there's a lot of nosy people out there that are looking at the divorce announcements and then they rattle it off to their kids and then the kids permeated it back to our kids. It was a nightmare. Oh my God. Before you do, before I mean, you had already, to tell them? I'd already moved out and, but it was just the event that that occurred. I was like, Oh my gosh. So yeah, there's a, I mean, people just relish drama and embrace offering opinions about this or that and how they should handle a situation. And, you know, you just kind of have to have those blinders on. It's always good to maybe get get advice, but get advice from people that you trust and you really value their opinion and everybody else is just noise. You just got to just mute it out. Yeah, I think that's so true. And, you know, one of the things that I learned is that the people that had the biggest reactions to my divorce were the people who were divorced within the next year. They were like the dominoes started falling, right? They're like, this is awful and you can't do this or whatever the like, you know, their big emotional reaction was and like cut to, (laughs) it's like, oh, you didn't like the mirror I was holding up for you. That's what that was about. That had nothing to do with me. Right. Right. Did you see that? Did you find that yes. in your world? Yes. You know, now when I hear when someone comes, the reaction is always to the negative. You always dive to the negative when you hear about it. And there's like, for example, the most common response that you get when you hear that someone's getting divorced is, oh, I'm sorry. Well, maybe it's a good thing. So I tell maybe people, great. I tell yeah. people when, when they tell me, I'm like, so should I say I'm sorry or congratulations? You tell me. And let them tell me, they might, they may say, this is the best thing that's ever occurred to me. And they're like, okay, great. And congratulations. 
So we you know, divorce, divorce automatically defaults you in the loser category. You know, you're a fail, you failed in something, you're a loser. And, we, you know, I'm trying to write, we got to get out of that mindset and say, look, we all make mistakes. And a set of circumstances occurred that triggered an event called a divorce. Doesn't mean that you're a loser and you got to get out of that mindset. That's part of the issue in healing and recovering is because you believe that mindset to be true. And then you're dealing with guilt and all those yep. emotions that are associated with it. And it's the, it's a failure, right? It That's is. the other one failure. And it's, and it's just not, it's just not, it doesn't have to be right. It's not, it's yes. not an A or F score in, in a divorce either you know, right. or in your marriage, rather you're either going to get an A or you're going to get an F, right? Right. It's pass fail. You know, it was a B plus, but right. you know, Right. And people, you know, people talk about how, you know, it basically divorce is a failure, but then, you know, you think about those relationships that went, you know, went on for eternity that were abusive or where people were miserable, utterly miserable together. And like, yet they stayed married. Is that, is that a success? Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely. I want that. And, and there's stories and you've heard time and time again, people that said, maybe even particularly from the women's perspective, it was one of the scariest things that I ever, that, that decision was one of the scariest things that I ever did, but oh my gosh, yeah. looking at it one, two years from that on, it's the best decision that I've ever made. Absolutely. In many cases, not all cases, but many. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is part of really why you created um, Divorce Over 40, right? Was this community of people who get it, who aren't judging you, who are, you know, giving you the right advice or the, or at least informed information. And now you guys are doing, you guys are spreading out, right? You're, you're spreading out all over the country. It's absolutely <laughs> nuts. It's like a virus that's spreading, not COVID. But it is. <laughs> literally, literally during the actual virus that's spreading. <laughs> well, what happened is, so we were having these little events or these, we were, when we hang out on Fridays, it was always this divorce circle of friends. It was a pretty a tight group that had formed over a repeated number of events. And we posted pictures. And so we started getting people that were following the blog that said, Hey, how do I get invited? And there were people we absolutely knew nothing about. And, uh, you know, as a well-intentioned, I want to be part of that, but you know, you're not going to invite a ton of strangers to your house for a cookout. Right. So right. We said, you know, I kept getting these requests and that I finally said, well, why don't we just have a happy hour and invite everybody to come? It's in, in a public forum. And so it's safer. And, and so we set out this announcement and particularly just in Tulsa, and we had like 85 people RSVP for the first one. And I'm like, oh holy smokes, I don't and, you know, not that many came. I think it was maybe we only maybe had 10 to 15 because we were right in the middle of COVID. And, mm -hmm. But it, we started to piggyback off of that. And our, and our community started to grow in Tulsa. It's now to a point where if we were to have an event, we'd probably have 75 to 100 people there. And so as we have started to grow through social media outside of Tulsa, we've had a lot of people now say, so initially it was, I want to be at how do I get invited, invited to your party? Now it's the outside. <laughs> how can I come to Tulsa and hang out with you guys? And we started to get those from Chicago right. to, I had a lady in Jacksonville that wanted to come. I had a lady in Madrid that said, I want to come to Tulsa and hang out with your friends. And I'm like, <laughs> we're not that cool. We're not that cool. Trust me. You totally are. You, you totally are. You Dave. just have a secret recipe for how to, how to create a social environment for people that are our age. That's it. We have a recipe. Well, and, and the, yeah. And part of that recipe to be super clear is that this is not a dating. This is not a mixer, that's right? Correct. That's like one of the, yeah. So talk about that. Cause I think that's really important. Well, one of the things that we set out when we had our first happy hour and we've done it with in every subsequent event is we were, we've been very explicit in saying, this is not a dating event. This is a, this is an event that people have asked for because they're people are lonely and they want connection and they want friendships. And like every other divorced person, you you struggle with friendships and creating friendships. And there's not a whole lot of settings or venues or opportunities to create those friendships. And so right. we've been very explicit to that. 
Now we recognize that some people don't come with those motivations, uh, but most do. We haven't had any problems so far. And you know what? Our mentality, and I think everybody's mentality is, it's creating an organic environment for people to meet. So our relationships naturally going to evolve. Heck yeah, they are, but they're organic. Sure. Right. They're based in friendship. They're based in something. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so we've been, yes. that's always been the board baseline. We actually were thinking about creating a true mix or we were going to have, we're having a big event in late April, assuming COVID clears where we're letting people come asking people to come to Tulsa because everybody wants to come to Tulsa to hang out with the cool group, I guess. I'm going to come if I can, come. if it's safe, I'm totally coming. And um, we had a, uh, a matchmaking service that wanted to sponsor it. We were really excited because it was a sponsor, but then we looked back and we said, you know what, this is deviating from what we really intended this to be. And so we chose right. not to do that because we want this to be an opportunity where people, particularly the women, they can come, they feel safe. They don't feel yeah. like they're, there's predators that, that are there and more than likely they're going to come because of that, because we've set that premise. hundred percent, hundred percent. Cause it, it is true. I mean, every time we walk into a bar or whatever, you know, we feel like prey. Right. And so there's, so to, you can't eradicate that, but you can, but to be clear and direct about it, I think is Again, Daniel, unicorn. <laughs> no, it's us that's doing it. And, you know, we have discussion groups on Facebook now. And, you know, I actually piggybacked off of kind of what you're doing in oh. some of your groups where, you know, we have questions, particularly. Oh, yeah. This is not a group in which, particularly when it's a male, male female group. Right. Yes. They have good. to answer these questions. And one of them is, you know, you're not soliciting people you know, to date, and I can't remember what the other two are. And they, and if they don't answer yes on all three, then they're not going to get in the group. And so yep. um, it's kind of been a way to now, does it police it hundred percent? No, but at least people know going in, this is what our expectation is. And we'll just kick you out as fast as we bring you in. If you, if you violate. Good. Yeah. You got to moderate that shit. Like that's, that's why my Facebook group has become sort of like for, especially for women trying to going through divorce or the, should I stay or should I go? It, people say it's one of the safest places because I moderate the shit out of it. Right. <laughs> I don't stand for people violating the rules like that. My mind's only women, but like, I don't deal with, I don't, I don't let them bash men. I don't let them bash other women. You know, his fucking whore came up. Mm -mm. right. Nope. Right. Yeah. We're the same way. I've got, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've got some kind of troops, some, some folks that are policing those and they're like-minded with right. us and they have the same philosophy, but getting back to your point. Yeah. So we've started to have these people from out in other cities that have said, how can we replicate what you're doing in Tulsa? It's not, it's not always we want to come to Tulsa, but how can I replicate? And so what we've just, so we've had these people that are essentially points of contact in cities. We call them city ambassadors. They're an ambassador for what representing divorce over 40. And we've right. got 35 now and 30, I think 30 different cities across the country from we've got, we're, I'm working on a couple in LA and Orange County to Portland, to Chicago, to New York. We have three or four in New York. I've got Jacksonville. I mean, all across. I just had one in, in London that's reached out and another lady in Nairobi, Kenya, that's reached out wanting to start it. It's crazy. That's crazy. But it's all with the intention of, I want to facilitate an event or events that are going to break, bring people that are in the same stage of what I'm going through. They're divorced. Their kids may or may not be out of the house and they're yearning for friendships. That's the whole premise of why these people are wanting to do it. Right. Just, just creating community, creating community. I'm going to steal that. Go for <laughs> it. <laughs> you can have it. It's my gift to you. <laughs> I love it. So, okay, Daniel, tell, tell us where people can find you, where they can find Divorce Over 40 and anything else that you want them to well, know. Well, you can find all of our, let me start with the baseline. If you go to divorcedover40.com and the 40 is four zero. So the, all one word, divorcedover40.com. You can find all of our social media links. We're most active on Instagram and we also have a Facebook page. We try to provide content daily and we, we provide kind of a mix of personal everyday people perspectives like myself and a couple of the other co-creators. And we all always bring in someone from the community to provide 
uh, once a week, we call it a Friday feature and someone from the community writes about their divorce. But we also have a lot of experts that we've engaged with that we feel provide professional content and not the content. That we're <laughs> I owe you one of yes, those. Like I- you know, <laughs> dating coaches, not dating coaches, or I'm looking for one, but divorce coaches. Bella Gandhi. I know that's what Susan said. <laughs> you get that introduction. Oh yeah. I'll, we'll hook that up. Easily. We have a phenomenal sex therapist, you know, cause that's a whole oh. different challenge. Oh, yeah. We've got, of course, Susan provides more from an attorney perspective and, and the community loves the content that's coming out from the professional side. That's so great. So great. Yeah. We're, we'll talk after this about yeah. what, about what I'm going to write for you guys. All right. Divorced over 40. Dot com. Dot com and at divorced over 40 on Instagram. That's right. I just love what you guys are doing. And I love, I don't know. I love your story. There's just so much about we're, you know, we're like-minded. So I, so I love it. <laughs> And I'm grateful for you coming on and telling us your story and sharing um, all of this. I feel like there's more we could get into, but we'll save it for another time. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate the platform to be able to speak. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at The Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.